4 a.m. April the 2nd, 1982. Argentine Navy cameramen film their invasion of the Falkland Islands. Frogmen landed first from a submarine, followed later by the main assault force. Now, the, the situation, as you might hear, is that the radio station has now been um, taken over. If you, if you take the gun out of my back, I'm going to transmit it to you. But I'm not speaking with a gun in my back. By 7 a.m., after fierce fighting, the government house was completely surrounded. History bro, how are you? Hi, Mr. Thrall. It's a pleasure and honour to have a bit of your time. Um, I really appreciate it. If we, uh, yeah, if we could talk about the Falklands a bit. Is that what we've got on the, the docket today? Yeah, well... Your channel, um, I mean, you can see just by looking at your channel and for everybody watching, I suggest you do, you've, you've got a really good overview of, or not even just an overview, an in-depth, fairly in-depth understanding of history compared to probably someone like myself. Um, and I think we could talk forever, but shall we talk about the Falklands? Yeah, well, I'd really like to. It was when I first got in touch with you. It was just uh, one of the things that sprung to mind. Um, of course, your history with the uh, Royal Marines, uh, just to put it in a bit of context, I thought I'd say early on is that, you know, neither of us was there. If anyone's under any <laughs> weird idea, I, was, I wasn't even one years old. I was born in 1981. I hadn't even yet had my first birthday when the action went down on the Falklands there. And you were, I don't know, what were you, 10 or 12, that sort of age. Uh, but it's part of your regimental history, isn't it, um, the Falklands? And I'm, I've, I'm fascinated by all history, like you say, um, but anything that's with the British Army or British history, um, of, of course, fascinated by. And I've always uh, been interested in the Falklands, like the minutiae of it, what happened exactly in what order. And I know you've spoken to lots of guys that were there, you know, um, and so I've, you've spoken to lots of really quite serious individuals that were, you know, really there. So I... You know, it's a bit of an honour, really, to pick your brain about it and talk about it if you're if you're down for that. Yeah, let's go for it. How how did you get an interest in the Falklands conflict? Well, I mean, it's on the list, isn't it? I mean, it's quite a big conflict, really. Technically, not a war, but conflict, a, a police action. <laughs> um, what? What? Uh, why is it? Why is it not a war? Because it wasn't the countries facing off. Well, I think I think it's just technically, of course, it, it is a war, isn't it? Um, warfare happened. But I think just technically it's not a war because lo lots of conflicts post World, uh, World War Two weren't worse. Like Vietnam was never, I think, technically a war. It was always a conflict. I think originally it comes from Korea, where um, there was the massive UN actions, US and British actions in Korea. And the uh, president at the time, uh, Harry Truman, couldn't say it was war. He couldn't sort of formally say it was a war in a press conference because that is world war three at that point it was sort of tempting world war three uh, so he said it was sort of on the fly i said well it's uh when re reporters said well if it's not a war what is it shelling is going on lots of people are dying he said it's a, a police action <laughs> um so anyway it's just a politics thing to get around it just words isn't it but i think technically the falklands wasn't a war it was a conflict but i mean it's just it's just, it's just words isn't it really um uh, but yeah, so I thought if we could talk about it, I'd want to sort of, if, if we're only sort of playing with an hour or so, just sort of do an overview of, to begin with, why it happened. Um, sort of look at a uh, the, the bit of the history of Argentina and, and, and why they did it. And then look a bit at Thatcher and her government and the response, and then maybe talk all about, you know, the actual actions and what, what went down there. But I mean, if you wanted to say something about maybe sort of the, the regimental side of it, what a big part of it is for the Royal Marines, the story of the Falklands. Yeah, I'm all ears, Bo. Um, go for it. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, well, I mean, the, the leader of, of Argentina at the time was a, a, a General Leopoldo Galtieri. It was the Galtieri government. And um, I mean, I think it's I, I'm, I'm not for this, the bloody Argies sort of view. Um, you know, as I say, I was a little kid at the time. I don't remember it firsthand. So I look at it as like an armchair historian. That's all I am, a history fan with a with a mic and a laptop. Uh, it's as remote to me as the Boer War in a, in a way, you know. So, but I, I look at like the the history of Argentina up to that point, and it is 
it's quite a, quite a sad history, quite a fairly brutal history of what happened there. You know, um, you look at um, uh, Peron, the, the various Peron governments. <laughs> Um, and of course, he was a civilian, but he was a colonel at first, but he was a civilian. But Argentina had a succession of military governments, military leaders, um, especially since from 76 onwards. They called it the you know, junta, military junta, however you want to pronounce that, <laughs> probably butchering that word. Um, and there was a succession of, of military leaders there. And this Galtieri was the, the, the last one of them. Um, and there was a whole period there called the Dirty War um, in Argentina, where there was all sorts going down there. It really is a very complicated thing. Don't want to get into it. We haven't got time for that, really, because it really is super complicated, that Dirty War. But it was some sort of um, internal strife. I mean, thousands, tens of thousands of people were mixed up in it and got killed. And, um, and anyway, these military governments, the junta, were, were right leaning and their enemies were leftists, communists, if you like. Um, and so anyway, don't want to get into the weeds of all that. You end up with this Galtieri government who um, I think the picture was that they they planned, they wanted to have a war with Chile because Argentina's perennial enemy is, is Chile. Um, if, you know, if I suppose just historically speaking, the, the English's main enemy is the French or maybe the Scotch, you could argue, going back. I think for Argentina and Chile, they're each other's most bitter enemy. I mean, if you look at the map, they've got that massive long... Uh, border with each other yeah I think um a very high border as well isn't it because it's the Andes mountains that's right that's right and I think just in terms of just pure military might uh, Argentina is more powerful was back then as has always been more or less I think richer more more a bigger population and certainly their air force <laughs> then was a lot bigger than what Chile had um and anyway I, I think I may have some of these details wrong. As I say, I'm only an armchair historian. <clears throat> but I think Argentina were going to be going to war with Chile at some point in, in, in the like late 70s there. And for, for whatever reasons, it was put off. It didn't happen. And so I think the idea is that this, this Galtieri uh, uh, leader, general, um, sort of had to turn his eye of Sauron somewhere else. He had to do something else. You know, he was like, you've got this this military government and they sort of need to exercise what well, wasn't argentina in poverty at the time or some kind of um financial collapse yeah yeah there was all sorts of mass inflation and uh, financial collapse and like so, like you know a social collapse in many ways uh, i think um again it's quite a, a dark thing um this sort of a, a reign of terror of some type in argentina you know lots of disappearances that's the classic thing that there were people were actually I suppose it's a cliche in some circles to, for people to be disappeared, to be taken up into helicopters and, and disappeared. And well, well, this was it. This was the real thing, this, uh, this dirty war in Argentina. Um, well, the whole of South and Central America, um, the, the op Operation Condor, is it, that the Americans, this grand plan to uh, keep, keep leftists and communists out? Well, don't think me rude, but I've just put um, my search engine up on the other screen so I can have a little... Uh search about the things we're talking about so keep keep talking if you see me looking at that screen oh, i'm not, no worries I'm not trying to be rude <laughs> yeah no of course no worries um go ahead please do um yeah correct me if i'm wrong um on this stuff because some things especially with ancient history because that's really my forte is, is ancient history um you can sort of get away a bit with saying oh i think this i think that i read this 10 years ago so i think it was that whereas when you're talking about you know conflicts where people died and been terribly maimed and they're still alive and their families are still alive it's where the rubber meets the road a bit with someone like me a historian talking about stuff and it's still very real for people so it's you know it's not as okay just to say oh, I think this happened and, and just be flippant so you know I've, I'll, I'll have to be careful so if I do if you do catch me saying anything wrong do please do interrupt yeah you're very humble mate and I think it's good you say that it, it is We've always got to bear in mind, haven't we, that people fought, died and got injured. And, and not just that, there's how many, how many children have grown up with no father because they were killed in, the say, the Falklands conflict. I, I'm a bit like yourself, Bo. I kind of, I make it, uh, I make people aware I'm just an outside observer, you know, I'm, I'm I think that's the best way. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, I haven't spoken that much on my channel about very recent conflicts and things. So, you know, it's usually more ancient stuff or World War Two, at least, <laughs> you know, things like that. Um, so I'm going to, you know, be be more careful here. I probably will still uh, annoy some people by being flippant about it. I mean, I did a, a conversation with someone the other day and they mentioned the um, Falklands War and they, they mentioned it. Uh, uh, um, well, his atheism is unstoppable when he's an American. And he mentioned the Falklands offhand as um, um, just that it was uh, in, in the terms that it was a really one sided conflict. There was no way Argentina could ever have won it. And it was this silly little conflict that was of no real importance. And, um, and it's a bit embarrassing even for Brits to keep harking on about it and keep going on about it. Um, when in fact that's, I think, an extremely harsh and glib reading of really what happened. And anyway, in response to that, I said even more glibly, I suppose, I said, well, you're quite right. Um, Britain has got a nuclear, back then as well, had a nuclear capability and Argentina hasn't. So of course it was always a foregone conclusion. Um, now that's a bit of a silly thing to say as if we were, as if Thatcher was ever gonna nuke Buenos Aires, you know, it was never, it's never on the cards, of course. <laughs> um, but that is something I thought we could talk a, a little bit about in detail is that, that they put that together that task force really quite quickly. And that on the ground, the, the paras and the Marines and stuff are quite often outnumbered, heavily outnumbered. And, um, you know, you could look at it as in hindsight, like someone like me and say, couldn't they have taken months or a year or more and put together a much, much bigger, much, much more um, thorough task force, expeditionary force or something where the you know, maybe that could have happened. I don't, I don't know what you think about that. Well, wasn't it that, I mean, we're never going to know the whys or wherefores of this war, are we? I mean, it's not, some wars you can kind of trace the origins behind them, like the banking families, this kind of thing, the, the um, corporations and the like, but the Falklands is kind of an unknown, isn't it? Because I, I, I can only go on what I've heard people say or write about or what, what they said in documentaries. And it did seem like a move by Gautieri, wasn't it, to gain popularity by playing a, an easy and obvious card that would, would, that would stir up public fervour and get the country behind him. So that's the Ar Argentine side of things. As far as the British... Uh, sending a task force all the way, whatever it was, thousands of miles into the South Atlantic mm -hmm. at a time where I think our, at least our Navy was getting stretched for resources. It's hard to say, isn't it? There's the notion that Thatcher was a strong leader. They've invaded British soil. or They put the freedom of British subjects in jeopardy. And we are going to take action and the way Thatcher would have said it would or Margaret Thatcher would have said it would be uh you know Brit Britain will show them who's boss <laughs> something along along those lines right but then of course Maggie also got massive popularity following that war didn't she or as as a result of the victory if you if, if that's the right word at a time where her popularity was sub was previously suffering and then you hear that i think it's even members of her own family had shares in oil in the south atlantic around the falklands right I, i'm just putting this out there i'm not saying that's the case but yeah just to sort of go back to what what, what you originally said you know there's some things you're just possibly never going to know yeah i suppose so if we go back to the actual origin how it sparked off i mean i think it really was a surprise attack by the Argentines. Um, I've seen interviews with uh, members of Thatcher's government at the time. The foreign secretary was a guy called uh, Carrington, the Lord Carrington, I think it was. And he resigned immediately upon it happening because, you know, it's a pretty old school thing. You know, he's like saying, well, you know, it was on my watch that this thing happened out of the blue. It's only right that I should resign. Um, and I've heard, seen in other documentaries, other people, sort of, you know, really senior people in the government and in the... Um, in the in the Ministry of Defence and stuff, saying, yeah, it was uh, out of the blue. We knew they were doing um, 
exercises they were scheduled to be doing exercises all around there and we knew that that was all sort of cleared uh, but and then this attack came out of the blue because it wasn't just the Malvinas those those islands there was also a South Georgia and a few other small rocks in the sea that they in, invaded you know like an amphibious attack um, you know one day comes out of the blue as far as we're concerned sort of thing um, so yeah I, I said to you before when we were talking about setting this conversation up I, I said something I think it might be uh, fair to say in the interests of honesty uh, sort of where I'm coming from stuff the idea from from our point of view for Thatcher's government I, I was raised in a, 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 a labour household fairly sort of uh, wishy-washy <laughs> kind of labour household not staunch labour but certainly labour Thatcher was kind of the enemy I remember when I was a, a little kid and Thatcher was the prime minister she was sort of she'd stolen the milk <laughs> You know, that sort of thing. Um, and so I was, I sort of had this narrative that it was um, you know, somehow cynical on her part uh, to gain popularity or something like that. Um, or it was all about oil or had always been about oil or something like that. And uh, as I got older or in, in my adulthood, in my 20s and 30s, read, read about it and saw various things and, you know, come to your own conclusions, form your own uh, opinions entirely from the ground up. And... Um, I think now it was it was a just war. Um, it was a standing up to kind of blind aggression from the Gautieri government. Um, yeah, I don't, I, it, was a, it was a terrible, terrible shame that people lost their lives. But I, I would consider it a just war if there is such a thing. If, you, you know, some people would argue there's no such thing as a just war. All war is a complete failure of, of humanity <laughs> and politics. But if you're going to have them and if you're going to rank them in, you know, quite a glib way, of what wars that are more or less just, I think it, I, I would I would feel comfortable putting the Falklands up there. You know, yeah. I mean, how do you feel? As, putting aside any kind of you know political reasons why we might have gone down there or why Margaret Thatcher decided to send the task force, I guess we still got to remember that it, there's people living on this island that want want to be British. That's the key thing, Chris. Yeah, and and not just want to be British, but like they've got their own rule down there. Do you know what I mean? They they say how things go. I think the first thing that the Argentines did when they invaded was uh, force everybody to drive on the other side of the road. Um, yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that they're they're British people. There, <laughs> they certainly consider themselves British. I mean, it's funny when you go to places in the world uh, like Gibraltar or various sort of British protectorates or overseas territories, and they've got like the exact same letterboxes that you get in England. Or, or, or just uh, actually, it's a, a funny, a really telling little p a anecdote, little piece of evidence from uh, one of the Argentinian conscripts, sort of you know, eighteen, nineteen-year-old conscripts, many years later in an interview, saying that when he got there, when he got to the Malvinas, he was utterly shocked to see that it didn't look anything like Argentina. It looked like England. And that even, he said, even a nail, he sort of found a nail on the floor and it said made in England on it. Um, I was kind of surprised. And I've never seen a nail that says made in England on it. But anyway, <laughs> it's not the point. Um, yeah, they were surprised. They'd been told um, that um, this was just simply their land that had been stolen from them by, by the crown. Um, and and it was it was theirs to retake. But the, the reality is that, um, you know, the people on there, there'd been a plebiscite, hadn't there? There'd been votes various times. Uh, do you want to remain part of the, the Commonwealth or the British, um, the British protectorate? Or, and it, they were, well, they were all entirely loyal to, to Britain and had always voted to remain so. Um, and it's the same to this day. Uh, but it does hit on that thing of the, the from the Argentinian side, their, their, um, their, uh, uh, what's not motivations, their, um, well, yeah, yeah, their motivations for taking it. Um, was that they considered, they say things like, well, it's part of their continental land mass. It's on the same continental shelf as as their, as them. So, but that's nonsense. That doesn't mean anything. Ireland is on the same continental shelf as Westminster. It doesn't mean you automatically, it doesn't work like that. I mean, if you want to look at the history, just a very quick bit of detail, um, you know, like it was never, Britain had landed there and colonised it and, you know, had it as theirs since before Argentina was a country. Uh, you know, it goes back to Hawkins, you know, it goes back to like what, the 15th century or something. And uh, um, I, I think 
briefly Argentina did sort of you know technically own it for like a period of 10 years there but for hundreds of years for hundreds of years it's been um uh, British and you know so so that's the way it is that's sort of the political reality of it and when they did invade actually um in 1982 when the Argentinians you know sent amphibious landing crafts over and landed men on there and forcibly took it um the rest of the world did say you know that's that's bad you can't be doing that because Britain said we're not having this right guys you know we're going to do something and and they all sort of on the political side diplomatic side said yeah no it's terrible we condemn Argentina um we're not going to help you Britain in any way by the way but yeah we condemn it sort of on paper because Britain said that just said just immediately you know we're going to do something about this and our European allies, Lindy Beige, the history is the History Channel. Lindy Beige has got a funny. He's, he describes this in quite a funny way. Um, the um, all our European allies, you know, countries like Germany and France, they said, "Oh, of course we condemn the uh, the aggression of Argentina, um, but we're not going to help you in any any possible way." <laughs> so Britain turns to the UN, um, you know, being a member of the Security Council, um, you know, one of the big players, supposed supposedly. Uh, ask the UN to help, and they're like, "Yeah, no, we again, we condemn Galtieri's government, but um, yeah, you're on your own." <laughs> so, so perhaps we could turn to the mighty NATO, the uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, that's always there to protect any member of NATO who is aggressed against. We'll have the they will have everyone else in the in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. They'll be there to back them up and save them. But NATO, which is of course really led by America largely. They said, yeah, no, you're on your own. Um, again, we condemn Argentina for this naked aggression, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, you're not getting any planes or anything. <laughs> Come on. So anyway, Britain really were on their own. America did try to help, uh, to be fair, diplomatically. Uh, they, <laughs> but, but again, weren't prepared to do anything unilaterally to help us. So, so Thatcher says, right, we're going to put together a, a task force, this task force. Um, which was two two aircraft carriers, or was it the Hermes and the um, uh, the one you were on? What you were on? Um, was it the uh, Invincible? The Invincible, of course. You you were stationed on the Invincible, weren't you? At some point later. Yeah, yeah, for a, a little over a year. So I think I think the Invincible was sort of cutting edge at that time in eighty two. It was like brand new, more or less. I think. Uh, but anyway, she sends down two two these two aircraft carriers support, supported by loads of other cruisers and destroyers and and things. <laughs> 120, 130 odd ships in total, I think the whole flotilla was in the end, this task force they sent down there um, to take it back. And um, But it wasn't this, it was sort of a kind of a, a close run thing. I mean, the air war where we only had, what was it 20, 25, 30 odd sea harriers versus over a hundred skyhawks and and all this. But yeah, if you want to get, if you want to get into sort of the, the detail of, of, of what went down, I mean, um, have you got any other th thoughts on sort of like, um, Thatcher or sort of the politics um, and the diplomacy, how it all sparked off? Well, it was all, um, what's that word? Brinkmanship. There was something I wanted to say about brinkmanship. I think, I think that's what Galtieri is really, really guilty of. He, he didn't think we'd do anything and we called his bluff. Yeah, that's a word I, I don't think I've ever used in my life. Brinkmanship. <laughs> yes. No, what was I was going to say, it, you know, we were on a dodgy wicket going down there, weren't we? Because we had to rely on the fact that we still had relationships with Chile. And I think Chile were falling out with Argentina over another land dispute between the two countries. So fortunately, Chile allowed us to lend, was it to land some of our aircraft there for refueling and this sort of thing? And then, of course, Chile, America... played, Chile played a fairly big role, to be fair, in, in some ways. Sorry. Yeah. Camera. Well, Sorry. and then America sat on the fence, didn't they, for uh, for even like a long way through the, the conflict. And to think towards the end, we were running out of ammunition. And just at that point, I think the America sided with us, if that's the right expression. And we got a resupply. I might be wrong on that. I'm just say, saying the things that I've heard. Yeah, no, the, one of the main figures was um, uh, Alexander Haig, General Alexander Haig. I don't know if you know him or heard about him. He was sort of a big shot sort of on the international station, a diplomat. Um, I think he was head of the State Department at the time, but he'd been around for years. He'd, he'd been Nixon's chief of staff 
um, you know, like 10 years earlier and stuff. And anyway, he was sort of one of the, the big shots in for, for America, who was sort of going backwards and forwards between London and Buenos Aires and the UN and trying to trying to make, you know, the hot war not happen. Um, Cause that's, I think that's what a lot of people thought. That's what everyone thought it would be whilst in the three or four weeks it took to get this task force together and send it down the seven, 8,000 miles down to, uh, down to the Falklands there. They thought it would get um, resolved politically before any shots had to be fired. And of course we know, you know of course in hindsight, that didn't, ha it didn't happen, but he was one of the main people that did try really hard to make it not happen. I think at one point, because if we lose one of those aircraft carriers, the whole point of having two aircraft carriers is the a contingency thing. If one goes down, you've still got another platform to land your planes on, but you kind of need two. And if one had been sunk or something, which wasn't completely inconceivable, I think America said, you can have one of our carriers. I heard in an interview, one of the really, really senior Navy guys like that, Admiral Sandy Woodward or somebody super senior said that the Americans had offered one of their aircraft carriers if it really came to that. Um, and I think the logistics, the practicality of that is extremely difficult. You can't just give us one of their aircraft carriers to just start operating. They'd have to operate it themselves. It would mean them being involved in the war. So I don't know how serious or how close that came to happening or whether it was really ever going to happen or anything like that. But the Americans were in the end on our, our side, of course, I suppose. The special relationship is worth something. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, for a long time, they just wanted it not to happen. They just wanted it to all go away. I think most of the international community just wanted it to just go away because um, it's just it's sort of an unpleasantness, isn't it, really, um, <laughs> as far as they're concerned. Um, I think a lot of the international community couldn't really understand uh, in some ways, why both sides were so serious about it and were prepared to go to war over it. They, you know, I've heard a really senior, senior American diplomat say, you know, it didn't make any sense to some people, this small, this small rock in the South Atlantic. Um, but, you know, it's uh, like I say, sort of a naked aggression thing. It's a matter of principle because, you yeah, know, those military governments of Argentina, you say they were definitely going to have a war, probably I say definitely, who knows, but there was always conflict with Chile and in, in, in the south there, Patag uh, is it like southern Patagonia? Anyway, the south, Argentina had to, um, designs on controlling all of that, I think. Um, and so it was really, really in Chile's interest to help us out as much as possible. You know, my enemy's enemy is my friend and stuff. <laughs> but that, yeah, they really helped in loads of ways, allowed loads of special forces to land inside Chile and do all sorts of things. And um, yeah, and uh, we had, I think uh, that we had, uh, what were those massive uh, bombers? Is it the Vulcan, Vulcan bombers? They were allowed to sort of fly out of Easter Island and stuff to do reconnaissance, high level reconnaissance, because Easter Island belongs to Chile. So Chile helped in loads of ways. They, they, it was really in their interest for Argentina not to win <laughs> that conflict. Mm. What, you're right. You're I, I'm, I'm just looking at the the map. It seems Easter Island seems an awful long. Oh, way it's way out there west. Yeah, it's way out there west. But that's the whole point. That's the whole point. It was sort of really high level reconnaissance, and they weren't supposed to ever know. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but um, yeah. So they they land on on the Argentines invade those islands, and Thatcher decides to get together uh, uh, this task force and send it down there. And that was one of the questions I asked earlier, um, because when they ended up the boots on the ground, they did, you know, come into conflict at places like Goose Green and, and uh, uh, um, uh, um, um, oh God, what's the capital called? Stanley. Oh, sorry, yeah, at Stanley, all the various battles around Stanley. Um, quite often the Marines and the Paras and, and the guards that were there were quite often outnumbered quite heavily. And so just as uh, 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 a historian looking back at it, don't, I always think this, couldn't they have spent, instead of doing it as quickly as possible, on a, on a, not on a shoestring, I mean, it's two aircraft carriers, but um, instead of doing it in four weeks flat, couldn't they have taken, this is just a grand strategic level sort of idea, couldn't they have taken six months and put together an overwhelming force so that so that you didn't end up with, you know, like four or five hundred Marines versus twelve hundred conscripts. It would have just been. Well, you probably could have forced any garrison on there to surrender, you know, if you built up an over some sort of in crazy, overwhelming force. What do you think about that is what do you think about that idea just in general of putting together something in four weeks and just going bang? And Well, 
that's is that full hardy thing. even i think uh a, a military strategists would debate this till the cows come home wouldn't they i bet there's no simple answer to it the longer you leave the longer we left the argentine troops there the longer they had to dig in to fortify their um you know their foxholes and this sort of stuff to put in um more air defense i don't know bring in more ships what whatever the case may be i still don't that still doesn't necessarily mean they would have won or fought off the british but it would have meant a lot more people would have died yeah i mean possibly yeah i mean who knows i suppose yeah it's uh, silly really to try and think what might have happened if you'd done this or that but um yeah talking about so like the actual action i suppose when it started the british said there'll be an exclusion zone like 200 nautical miles around uh, around the islands um and so in any war you have to get um sort of air superiority is the key thing isn't it first and foremost whoever controls the skies um and so this carrier group <laughs> go in there and I suppose one of the first things one of the sort of the headlines of, of, of debate or to talk about is the uh sinking of the Belgrano and sort of the, the naval engagements that happened before you know there are many boots on the ground um I mean what do you think about the, the Belgrano and what happened there or for people that don't know sorry um I've been accused a few times recently in comments of uh, assuming people know what I'm talking about without giving any background. So I suppose just real quick, there was uh, the, the, one of the biggest ships in the Argentine Navy was the Belgrano, a big big cruiser class ship, which had massive five inch gun, which is massive. It was bigger than any, any naval guns we had on our ships. So essentially it was, in essence, it was possible for it to just shoot us. <laughs> um, so it's a, a, a real threat. Um, <laughs> And we didn't have the entire British Navy down there. We just had this task force. So anyway, they decide that this, uh, the, the Belgrano is a real and present danger and they sink it. One of our nuclear subs, um, yeah, sh shot her torpedoes at it and sunk it. Um, uh, and lots of men died. I mean, over 300 or 320 odd uh, Argentinian sailors died on that. Um, I think it was the uh, HMS Conqueror was our submarine that did that. And apparently there was, uh, they sent it directly back to the cabinet in London to uh, Margaret Thatcher herself to sort of okay it, uh, which she did. And, and that's what happened. And um, I think, well, why it's a talking point um, is that some people have said that that was sort of a, well, on one end of the spectrum, her detractors would say that's kind of a murderous act. She's sort of murdering these Argentinian sailors needlessly um because the, the things like the belgrano was steaming away um and they weren't a present threat and it was against rules of engagement and this sort of thing and i think nearly all of that is wrong it was a completely legitimate i think in legally it's completely legitimate action it was steaming towards uh the exclusion zone and uh yeah there was nothing to prevent us from legitimately sinking it was it was going to be it was, yeah, it sort of had to happen because it turned the entire Argentinian Navy around. They had another battle group with their aircraft carrier that was steaming towards it on the north. And it, it, it turned them around and um, sort of they never really came out of port again, essentially. Um, so it was, uh, that's sort of the talking point. It was, uh, so what do you think about the Belgrano incident? It's just fucking harsh, mate, isn't it? Full stop. I mean irregardless of the, the the whys and the wherefores 323 people died when that ship went down it's 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 hard to fathom that isn't it all the families the relatives that have then got to live with the fact that not only do they lose their loved one but You've got uh, the, uh, the Argentine government are going to play up the fact that they were sailing away from the exclusion zone. Um, people are not going to let that, not going to let that go, are they? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that was the case. I don't think they were sailing away from it. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm just saying the Argentine government, what, what with their slant on history and politics, would have it that, oh, we were, you know, we were, we were in the right, so to speak. Yeah, no, I, it, it's again, 
there's so many open-ended questions, aren't there, around the, the Falklands conflict? Yeah, war is hell. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, well, after that, the uh, the battle group had sort of control of the seas, more or less. But the Falklands are only, I say only, it's quite a long way, but 400 odd miles from the mainland of Argentina. So they could fly their uh, fighter planes, their sort of ground attack fast jets um, out there and back. Um, so, so there was still a war in the air to be had between the Argentine Air Force and uh, the British fighters that we could get off of these carriers. Um, and as I say, I think we had, it was mainly the, the famously the sea harrier we had, wasn't it? I think there was only sort of, is it 25 or 30 odd at most um, versus what they had a lot. I think they had a few different things, mirages and things, but mainly the famous one is the... Um, the, the Seahawk, isn't it? Is it also oh, Skyhawk, the A4 Skyhawk, um, where you see there's lots of footage of those screaming around St. Carlos Sound, isn't there? Um, very famously bits of footage. Um, and they had quite a lot. Uh, the Argentines actually had a fairly big air force. I think they had over 100 operational fast jets to begin with anyway, um, which, um, you know, is not insignificant at all. But I think the Sea Harrier just proved to be, because that was relatively cutting edge as well at the time, uh, pretty new, I think, and uh, people just say it's a lot more manoeuvrable uh, than um, than those than those Skyhawks, um, and so we couldn't really afford to lose hardly any Harriers. Um, but yeah, th their attrition was just worse in the air war. We were able to shoot down, and uh, one of the things that gets said a lot is that their pilots were extremely brave <laughs> and did some uh, very uh, uh, very risky manoeuvres and things uh, like stayed with it moments before hitting the ground and stuff like that um but yeah i suppose that's one of the the sort of um talking points one of the things that comes up a lot that whenever you see anything about the falklands quite often it is the footage from saint carlos bay uh where we had a lot of our landings or a lot of the uh ships were there and that's where the argentines sent a lot of a lot of their aircraft to you know a lot of, lot of stuff went down there it's full on isn't it if you're yeah. if you're crew on one of those ships sat in San was it San Carlos Sound, San Carlos Water. Yeah, yeah, San Carlos San Water, Carlos, in, cool, San Carlos in, Bay. In, I mean it's it's just beyond belief these the to think that at any moment you could be sunk. Yeah, this is war, isn't it? It's um it's not pretty. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, like with your the, the regimental history of the Marines, I mean, yeah, you've spoke, as I say, you spoke to a lot of people that are actually there and stuff. I mean, um, uh, when you were coming up, were there even guys that were, you know, older than you and more senior in, in the Marines that had actually been there and you speak to them about what happened or their experience, what they saw and things like that? Yeah, you. I've met many, um, many fellow Marines that served down there. I guess at this point, I should say we call it core history. Marines being part of the Navy and obviously regiment being a, an army term. Sorry. No, it's fine. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me, but I know some people will be going. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, it, it was a real era in core history that the, the 80s leading into the 90s. I mean, the Marines are hard enough. But that period and the events that happened and, and the type of Marine that the Navy was recruiting at the time just led to some seriously hard men. Um, and of course, a lot of Falklands vets made up the training teams at Limston. So, yeah, you know, you had battle hardened corporals teaching you how to how to fire your 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 rifle and you'd, you'd hear some stories from them. The most stories I've I've heard are from my friend H. He's just been diagnosed with PTSD, and he's he's obviously older than me. Only just been diagnosed with it. He's had to live his whole life with the memories of being what probably nineteen years old, advancing up those mountains into contact, and then having to wait for someone to get shot before you take cover sounds a bit crazy doesn't it when you advance to contact as we call it you don't take cover until you get 
effective enemy fire and effective enemy fire is when someone gets hit. <laughs> I guess the point there is you don't want to start taking cover if you're miles away from, from the trenches where, you're, where your enemy is dug in. And he said, Chris, he said, you learn all this stuff in training now about section attacks and putting down um, sustained fire to keep the enemy's heads down while the other sections or troops move up the hill. He said, fuck all that bullshit. He said, <laughs> in the Falklands, so everyone just lined up. First thing they did, if they hadn't done it already, was ditch their, we call it battle bowlers, which is your helmet, um, and put their green berries on. He said, so if you look behind you, there was just a long line of, of helmets all, all the way along sort of the bottom of Mount Harrier or Mount, Mount Kent. He said all these weapons drills that you go through in, in um, how many, uh, what am I trying to say? You go through so many times in the Marines, safety catch, change lever, off magazine, check your, t t all, all this kind of stuff, which gets drilled into you. Again, he was like, <laughs> he said, Chris, fuck that. He said, you just charged up that hill, firing your rifle as, as rapidly as you could. When that magazine was empty, none of this, you know, stow it away in one of your, what we call pooches, pouches. He said, fuck that, it's throw that fucking thing away. You know, reach in your combat jacket, grab another one. He said, get the fucker on your rifle quick and, and, and keep, keep going. When they got back to 4-5 Commando, um, one of the first things they, they had on their timetable, on their schedule, was weapons training. And... He said the, corp the corporal taking the session was like, oh, guys, come on, put some effort in, like, pay attention. And they're like, nah, fuck that smudge. <laughs> and he said it's because they were so uh, just demoralised by the fact of what war is really like as opposed to perception it would be like from their tra training. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I think maybe nearly every generation of soldiers, certainly when there's a gap of, of a hiatus between wars, every new generation is kind of surprised by that, it seems. I mean, I saw your your interview with, is it uh, Nigel Spud Ely? Is, is that right, Spud? Yep, Spud, yeah. Um, who was in the Paris at the time and was there, wasn't he? And he went on to be in the SAS. And um, his, some of his accounts from it are, you know, really quite harrowing, you know, guys crying and body parts and the whole, you know, the whole nine yards. Um, so, yeah, it's like, uh, obviously, uh, uh, that's why I think it's kind of weird that there's some perception out there that it was this rinky-dink little tin pot end of the pier war that didn't, was sort of nothing over a, a rock in the sea. And, in fact, there was some uh, pretty crazy actions that went down, you know, the reality is some quite, you know, pretty, pretty crazy stuff. Um, I suppose, yeah, getting into it a bit, the, uh, the, the, the famous yomp across the island. Uh, well, one of the things was that uh, one of the, what, what we did lose quite a lot of ships, you know, like uh, the, the Sheffield and the Ardent, the, sadly, like the, the Sir Galahad and the Sir Tristan, terrible burns, like the Welsh Guards lost some, lots of guys there. But, um, you know, the Antrim, the Argonaut, the Antelope, the list goes on. But one of the big ones was the Atlantic Conveyor, which was like a, a civilian ship that, Got hit. I think maybe with a might be one of the the French built exosets because they, I think maybe I might be getting some of these details wrong, but I think the Argentine mistook it on their radar for one of our carriers because it was so massive, and fired one of these extremely valuable exosets they had. They only had like five, I think, these missiles that we couldn't shoot down. Um, anyway, anyway, the Atlantic Conveyor, this big ship, was hit and it's really terrible, lots of burns and stuff. But one of the, I think, one of the repercussions of that was that it was holding loads and loads of helicopters our helicopters and so the idea was to have our men's helicoptered in to to stanley uh, a lot do be doing that quite a lot yeah, and it, it, it couldn't happen because they were all lost in that and so you, we ended up with lots of marines and paris walking across the island and it's not a tiny island i mean we're talking you know tens of miles isn't it 50 miles or what i mean if, you must know a great deal about the yomp yeah, well, the, the helicopters were Chinooks, I believe, and they would have, they could have been used to, to carry, I think a, ch a Chinook can basically hold a whole troop troop of men. 
and obviously carry them um, wherever they needed to go. It's like our American brothers and sisters won't go anywhere without <laughs> fuck that man we, we ain't walking over there <laughs> they just they always wait for the choppers but they were a lot of them went all, all, all these chinooks went down on the atlantic conveyor and i think it left two serviceable cargo helicopters that that's hence why you hear about this infamous yomp yeah we lost a lot of sort of our air mobile capability i think in that and so, yeah, it was left with, because um, I think one of the things, correct me if I'm wrong about this, uh, just sort of the perception I think a lot of people have is that a, a lot of the boots on the ground in the Falklands were Marines and Paras, um, but there were all sorts there, actually. You know, like I said, the Scots Guards were there, the Welsh Guards and uh, various other, special, lots of special forces, um, you know, um, were, were there beforehand, probably long beforehand, <laughs> hiding in the ghouls and things. <laughs> um, but... Um, yeah, I suppose one of the big actions before you get to sort of Stanley and the final um, retaking of, of Stanley and the end of the of the actions, uh, Goose Green was one of the big things. And, and um, there was a few actions because you mentioned a few of the hills um, around. So a lot of the a lot of the uh, stuff that went down fighting, you know, really close up amongst it uh, in trenches that, that the Argentines had built and their makeshift defences around um, sort of farmsteads, homesteads, and sort of remote buildings on, on the hillsides on down there on the Falklands. Um, yeah, a lot of it was, uh, a lot of it did come sort of quite close. So Goose Green, for example, um, that was, that is one of the, one of the bigger ones, wasn't it? Where quite a few guys uh, died yeah, that's there. Run. That's where Colonel H. Jones lost his life, isn't it? Right. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say something about that. Again, that's one of the things that comes up quite often if you sort of read a book or watch a documentary about the Falklands, the uh, uh, the story of that. So if anyone doesn't know, the, uh, it was a very senior, very senior guy, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, I mean, he was the commander, uh, the, the commanding officer of the whole of the second battalion of the Paris, wasn't he? So uh, I believe so. And um you know, that's really quite senior, as I understand it. I've, I've already been corrected on one thing already, and I'm like a proper civvy, get things wrong. Um, uh, like uh, at what sort of division level he was, and to have it really clear in my mind how senior he was. It, am I wrong to think that being the CO of two para on the ground there, that is really quite, really quite senior. Like he was sort of the, the if you think of it as a, probably a bad uh, analogy but if it was an organism he's sort of the brain of it uh, is is that wrong to think of it in those terms what, what do you think well he was the commanding officer of two para and traditionally <laughs> the argument would be he should be at the back you know dictating or call, um, calling out the moves so to speak with his um radio you know via his radio operator and in this almost um, kind of Hollywood scenario, he charged an enemy trench and got shot dead in the process. But yeah, it was it was a shock. I mean, how the hell two para must have felt knowing their commanding officers dead. Um, fortunately, they had a chap, Chris Keeble. I think it was a major at the time who stepped up to the plate. Well, you know, that was his job to step up to the plate. If if Sunray, as his um, call sign was, uh, got killed. And apparently, uh, well, he did. He obviously did an ec excellent job. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, well, it's this old, it's a thing that sort of goes back as old as time to ancient times even. Um but how much should the a commanding officer or the, the, the a general or something be right up in the thick of it? Um, so, for example, there's a there's quite a few anecdotes of Napoleon getting too far forward and his senior adjutants and officers saying, you know, come on, stop, stop being silly. You've got to get back now. You know, you're actually within range of the cannons. And uh, in World War One, there's lots of examples of generals getting killed uh, if you look at the lists some quite there's a fair few names that are generals and you know there's generals and then there's generals uh, but even senior generals were killed in world war one um and and you know it goes back to 
even ancient times, like should the king really fight on the front line? Um, is it prudent? <laughs> um, so anyway, I suppose maybe that debate does apply to H, um, Lieutenant Jones. Um, he did get the VC for that, though, didn't he? I believe he was yeah, awarded but... the VC. And um, yeah. well, I know he was. I read the citation just the other day. Um, and so obviously the powers that be decided it was uh, a, a, a great and valiant, gallant action, which it was. I'm not saying it wasn't at all. It was. Um, the only thing I would say, I suppose, just, just to raise the question, who am I, some YouTube peon to question a VC? But <laughs> nevertheless, I mean, it's the job of a historian to ask difficult questions, maybe. Like if, how to put it diplomatically, but if um, sort of discretion might have been the more uh, prudent thing in that moment, on that night, in that moment to charge forward. I, I, I've heard accounts of guys that were right there with him that were saying, don't, don't charge forward. Like if you go around that corner or whatever it was, if you try and charge that trench, um, you know, that's, that, don't do that. That's crazy at this moment. Um, and that uh, and guys said they were saying that to him as he picked up a, a, a gun and, and charged forward. Um, so I don't know what well, it is, what it is that happened, didn't it? Um, and uh I think yeah. anyone that wins a VC is doing something insane, aren't they? They're not they're not doing what your brain would <laughs> ordinarily tell you to do. I think there's something about extreme bravery that God, I think a psychologist could just could spend hours discussing the factors that could, that lead up to people that do these incredible acts of heroism. Yeah, I only really mean he was too much of a hero. <laughs> His balls were too big. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to um, cast any uh, shadow on, on him or his memory or what he did at all. I mean, the guy who won the VC, the description of it is crazy. I mean, it's an incredible, amazing. Um, you know, there is, as you say, as you said straight away, there is just that, that question of whether it was sort of uh, the most prudent thing for the CO to do. I mean, it says in the citation that the only reason he was there is because he actually really did honestly uh, you know need to see what was going on so there, there was a proper good reason for him to be up there it was just that that sort of final action of running for even further forward and the justification is it was to keep the the momentum going um but as you said is that does that really come within the remit uh, that's a good way of putting it is that really within the remit of his role to to to, to, to do that that's all um that's all yeah that's a sort of armchair warriors topic isn't it yeah, God, I mean, it's easy for me to sit here and say I've never served a day in the services of my life just to, and just say, was that the right thing to do? I mean, it's kind of well, he would have gross in a way for me even to question it. But there you go. I mean, got to do it, really. He must have been under extreme pressure, not not just the battle and leading, leading his men into combat. But Goose Green, as far as the tactics were concerned, Goose... Goose Green had to be out of the way so that they could break out of San Carlos, if, if I understand correctly. And I guess being pinned down must have been incredibly frustrating. And you're the CO, it's, you know, there's, it, the, the ball's in your court, you know, the buck stops with you. Possibly that, that was, like I say, one of, I've no doubt, many, many factors in his spur of the moment decision. Yeah, but I mean, so I think they're at Goose Green or uh, uh, those various hills around Goose Green that were contended. I mean, I think we're talking like, yeah, 400 odd paras versus about 1500 Argentinian soldiers, whether they were all sort of 19 year old conscripts, as they're often described. I don't think they were all, I mean, Spud uh, <laughs> did suggest that they were probably might have been uh, a lot more seasoned than just 19 year old kids. But Anyway, they, the the British <laughs> forces were outnumbered heavily, uh, but you know still took those positions and took lots and lots of lots and lots of captives. And uh, yeah, they were able to sort of move on to Stanley. And I suppose the the final chapters of it, or the various peaks around to to the west of Stanley, um, you know, a lot of them got names people might have heard. You know, tumble down, but there's Mount Longdon was one. There's lots of stuff. Mount Harriet. Um, but yeah, you mentioned a, a couple of others. There's a sort of half a dozen or more. Um, where, uh, yeah, lots of lots of firefights went down. The, you know, the Marines were there, weren't they? And um, yeah, if you want to talk about sort of the final, the final day days around Stanley. Yeah, I mean, the, 
the powers were massively up against her, weren't they? They were hugely outnumbered. The BBC had already broadcast to the world that um, the powers were going to attack at dawn. Fortunately, or allegedly, the Argentine commanders didn't take it seriously. They thought it was a, a ruse. But you're an 18 year old para going up a hill, knowing you're three times outnumbered, plus the fact the enemy know, knows you're coming. Yeah, they did well. The, it's a brave thing to do. Yeah, I think you um, sort of uh, very diplomatically skated over sort of the, uh, the, there's an element of treachery there, isn't there? If it was on the BBC, um, they've sort of, yeah. uh, they've sort of, they've sort of given the enemy, given away, regardless of whether the enemy commanders chose to ignore it or not, that the BBC did broadcast what the soldiers hadn't done yet, uh, which is, well, that's kind of a betrayal, isn't it? That's a, is it me or does that sound bang out of order? Oh, it's it's despicable. Um, right. You know, it, it doesn't matter what, again, what politics you want to get into. Some people would say, well, a, mi a military spokesperson would have told them what to say. It's kind of irrelevant. I think during when, you, when your country's at war, there's kind of a duty on you to do all you can to support the war effort, isn't there? As long as for moral reasons you 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 agree with it, I, I, I'd say you don't go telling the the enemy that five hundred men, many of them barely teenagers, who were doing an incredibly brave thing on behalf of their nation, you don't go telling the enemy that they're they're coming. It must have been incredibly demoralising. But I suppose, well, in the end, um, Stanley Stanley was taken. Um, and uh, and uh, well, th that was it. The uh, the Gautier government had to concede. I mean, there's something I was going to say earlier when we started talking about the diplomacy of it and the run up to it. Uh, all the all the diplomats, all the senior guys for America at the UN would say to the Argentines, they would say, "Look, you, you know you can't win, right? <laughs> you know if the Brits do decide they're going to take them back, they're going to take them back. There's, you can't stop them." So. Yeah, at what point are you going to back down? And of course, they didn't. That was the whole point. Um, so when it came when it came to the end of everything, and Stanley had been retaken by British forces, um, the, the Gautieri government didn't have much of a leg to stand on, and it fell quite quickly. Um, and I suppose just to to put a bow tie on it, uh, what happened? I, I mean, he was. He lived to be an old man, Galtieri, personally. Um, I think he, they, there were trials in Argentina through the 80s or, or from the 80s onwards of people that were in those various governments, those various military uh, junta governments. And uh, I think he did go on trial, well, he did go on trial at some point and go to prison for a while, but um, li lived to be an old man and most of it at liberty uh, still. So that's what happened to him. And we know Thatcher went on to, well, she was prime minister for like 10 years or more, wasn't it? She didn't leave until Gulf War One, sort of 90, 1990, 1991, before Major came in. So, yeah, that sort of uh, was at the, right near the beginning of her premiership. Um, and as you said, she went from being quite, um, you know, unpopular, because there was a lot of, we had a lot of e economic <laughs> unrest in the 70s as well, um, sort of four-day weeks and stuff and blackouts and things. And uh, But we had the boom of the 80s, which in some ways are kind of... Um, embodied by Thatcher in some ways, that the boom of the 80s and uh, that whole 10 years. I, I think of Thatcher in many ways as the 80s, <laughs> you know, in some sense. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that was the rest of her story. Um, God, I, so, I, I remember her coming to power in the 70s. That's right. uh, showing my age there. <laughs> yeah, and so I, I suppose that is sort of the, the, the story of the Falklands. I just wondered what else you might think about it or sort of well, now with sort of decades later, how it sort of exists in the in the popular consciousness, or how Brits think about it now, or, or certainly as yourself as a, a member of the Marines, how how it's sort of thought of. Yeah, I think we should point out here that we've, uh, as we said at the beginning, we were just going to cover this rudiment rudimentarily. I'm making up a word there, um, but just for the purposes of having a chat, weren't we? There's obviously so much more to the conflict in terms of individual's commitment the battles that were fought the the events that took place i would encourage anyone to read 
read a book on on the war. It's one called The Yompers. It's about four or five commandos, uh, Falklands War. There's one by a chap called Vincent Bramley. Uh, it's, he's written two books. The first one was about taking Mount Longdon and the Paris role, the Paris role in the Falklands conflict. Uh, what's it called? I was going to say, you took for hours just about the battle from Mount Longdon, didn't you? Um, yeah, he's got, I'm just going to look it up. It's something like Descent into Hell or something. Um, but in these books, you're, you're going to hear far more about what actually, I mean, the, the nitty gritty of, or the nastiness of what goes on in war than you will by listening to a podcast. Because, of course, on a podcast, a soldier, you can't really can't really describe what it's like shoving a bayonet through someone's eye. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? Whereas in a book, you get sort of the, the more undisclosed narrative. So, yeah, Excursion to Hell was his first book, mainly centred on Mount Longdon, and it's a real eye-opener. And his, sorry, his second book was Two Sides of Hell. And in that one, he, I think he flies to Argentina and he interviews a lot of the Argentinian military or soldiers that fought down there. Right, who was the guy you had on who wrote a whole book just about the first contact when the Argentinians first took Stanley in the first instance and there was only 70 or 80 odd Marines on the island that eventually gave up, not surrendered, but eventually put down their arms. Uh, you had a guy who wrote a book all about that. That was extremely interesting. Yeah, that's Ricky Phillips. He wrote about the first casualty. The first casualty, right, that's um, it. He's just about to release another one, so he'll be back on the podcast to talk about that. He, it's called, I think it's called Voices from Stanley. And it's a collection of the letters that were found that the Argentinian soldiers had, had written to be sent home or that were sent home. And Ricky's researched them and he's put them in a book. So mm. I'm looking, looking forward to reading that one. But yeah, the first casualty is about the actual invasion of the Falklands. So not, not the war itself. And it, it covers the, the fight that uh, 8, 8901 Naval Party put up. So it's basically a, um, a troop of Marines. I think there was actually two troops there at the time that tried to fight off. A few thousand Argentines. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it ended with a ceasefire. The, the governor, Rex Hunt, people call it a surrender, but appa uh, apparently it was a ceasefire. They, they organised a ceasefire. I mean, it would have been pretty foolhardy just to keep fighting, bearing in mind that eventually all the Marines would have been killed, wouldn't they? I mean, what, what could they do? They could have hidden out in the hills for a few days, possibly a few weeks at most before running out of food. Um, certainly no clean drinking water and of course running out of ammunition. And so the governor Rex Hunt made a command decision that he wasn't gonna, he wasn't gonna let that happen. And then the, the men of that party flew back to the UK via, via Chile, I think it was. I think they had a big knees up in, in Chile and drank a hotel dry of something ridiculous. It's quoted as a hundred thousand dollars worth of, uh, of alcohol then they flew back to the UK and they were repatriated with their units as the task force sailed back down again so or I think some of them might have joined their, their unit at Ascension Island. That is interesting to know isn't it that some of those marines that um, put their arms down at Stanley at the very beginning yeah they weren't sort of just imprisoned somewhere in Argentina they were just deported back to Britain essentially and then they some of the very same guys um, took the island back um, you know, that is that that is a very interesting thing from just a, a historian's point of view. Um, you know, very, very interesting. But there's so many, like I say, there are so many stories. I mean, one of the ones we didn't touch on, but I thought was fascinating is the idea of Operation Mercado. Do you know that one? It was an aborted thing that never happened. But it was this idea when they thought that maybe the Argentine Air Force would get the upper hand against our Sea Harriers, that there was some idea cooked up somewhere 
that um, they would parachute in like an entire um, squadron of the SAS or one, like just load dozens and dozens of guys to blow up the Argentinian airfields in, Ar- in, in Argentina and then just do a mass escape and evasion thing, you know, classic SAS stuff, but, you know, a suicide mission for most of them you would expect. And that they never did that. They never pulled the trigger on that because it wasn't needed. The Harriers did sort of do the job. Um, but just think things like that, you know, I could talk, I could talk about that for ages um, and all, all the, the background shenanigans that went on. That's just one story and that's something that didn't even happen. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's so much there to talk about. Hopefully this will just sort of wet the whistle of anyone that's interested in, in the history of the Falklands War. Um, and as I say, just giving it this grand overview, very broad strokes of the brush. Um, yeah, I hope I haven't, um, you know, trod on the toes of, you know, the survivors in any way. I hope we've been, uh, as you say, uh, humble enough to, to talk about it. No, Bo, I think it's honourable that that for someone who was only one years old at the time that you, you've taken an interest in, in it. And from, from obviously, a, let me say, a humanitarian perspective, and I, 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 I'd uh, laud you for that. <laughs> well thank you i mean yeah i mean if you ever did want to chat again about about anything i'd love to i mean if you're particularly oh, interested in um it's, it's what, what, so what would you be interested in if you did want to chat again if you've got any particular favorites that you've just read tons about and yeah you've done a lot of work on mao haven't you chairman yeah i did a massive series on mao yeah 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 and the cultural revolution my god i think if um everybody read a book that i read I've got it here somewhere around called Wild Swans by Jun Chang, I believe her name is. Have you read it? Yeah, yeah. Well, Yun Chang has written lots and lots of books about, about the Maoist period. Yeah, she's one of the, uh, considered one of the main people at the moment <laughs> writing about it. Yeah. Yeah, she talks about three generations of Chinese, of Chinese women growing up under under Mao and it's just an incredibly eye-opening and almost horrifying account but it's also quite pertinent at the moment when you see some of the stuff that's going on in our society or global society I mean when you hear terms like the great reset and all this all this kind of communist language and then you realize that Mao had his was it the great leap forward you can't make sense of what's happening now if you don't know your history so that's why I think it's great great having somebody like you on the podcast oh cheers yeah I mean so yeah like leftist authoritarian censorship (laughs) yeah if you want to see the extreme ends that goes to look no further than the Maoist period in China um yeah and as you say I suppose and I agree it is worrying that we're looking at the thin end of the wedge of that right now in our own time and societies unfortunately i fear um yeah yes definitely the topic for our next uh conversation perhaps oh yeah i'm happy to revisit now absolutely yeah i actually in that series i did 18 part series one of the first things i did a bit of an overkill <laughs> in a way but um um i didn't actually focus much on the cultural revolution i spoke loads mainly really about the great leap forward which is slightly earlier about 10 years earlier or so but um, yeah I could go into a lot more detail with you about the cultural revolution yeah it's a fascinating and horrifying thing and pertinent as well perhaps yes definitely definitely and your channel is history bro um can people just type that into the search box on youtube and it will come straight up i'm guessing it it does should be able to yeah should you'll just get history bro one word if you type that in um, and i'm on I'm on Odyssey now as well. Um, but yeah, a history bro. Excellent. And if you can send me your social media links, I'll put them below our, our podcast. All right. Cheers. Yeah, I haven't got many actually, but yeah, <laughs> I certainly give you what I've got. Yeah. So to everyone at home, massive thank you um, for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed this chat as much as I have. I strongly encourage you to go and check out Bo's channel. And if you could like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And Bo, just massive, massive thanks again, mate. No, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. You're welcome.